Hi, and welcome back to the Giving Project for Children's Chapter Book Read Alouds with Charlotte Webb. This week, we are going to continue our focus on retelling, our Five Finger Retells, and we are doing Chapter 6. This is Chapter 6, Summer Days. So, let's get started. Summer Days. We just left off where Wilbur has left or has seen Charlotte, and um, he's a little concerned that she eats flies and bugs and he's kept calling her bloodthirsty. But we know that Charlotte is gonna end up to be a really true friend. So let's jump right into chapter six, Summer Days. The early summer days on the farm are the happiest and fairest days of the year. Lilac bloom and make the air sweet and then fade. Apple blossoms come with the lilacs and the bees visit around the apple trees. The days grow warm and soft. School ends and the children have time to play and fish for trout in the brook. Avery often brought a trout home for his, in his pocket, warm and stiff and ready to be fried for supper. Now that school is over, Fern visited the barn almost every day. She would sit quietly on her stool and the animals treated her as an equal. The sheep lay calm at her feet. Around the 1st of July, the workhorses were hitched to the mowing machine and Mr. Zuckerman climbed onto the seat and drove into the field. All morning, you could hear the rattle of the machines as it went round and round, while the tall grasses fell down behind the cutter bar in long green swaths. Next day, if there was no thunder shower, all hands would help rake up the pitch and load and the hay would be hauled to the barn in a high hay wagon with Fern and Avery riding at the top of the load. Then the hay would be hoisted sweet and warm into the big loft until the whole barn seemed like a wonderful bed of Timothy and Clover. It was fine to jump in and perfect to hide in. And sometimes Avery would find a little grass snake in the hay and would add it to the other things in his pocket. This kid, right? Early summer days are a jubilee for birds. In the field, around the houses, in the barn, in the woods, in the swamp, everywhere, love and song and nest and eggs. So I know that visualizing isn't our strategy to focus on this week, but it would be really great for you to really think about what the visual of this picture is. So as I read this next section, I want you to get your movie brains going and I want you to picture and see what that's going to look like. Are you ready? It's really descriptive language. From the edge of the woods, the white-throated sparrow which must come all the way from Boston, calls, Oh, Peabody, oh, Peabody, oh, Peabody. On Apple Bow, the Phoebe teeters and wags its tail and says, Phoebe, Phoebe. The song sparrow, who knows how brief and lovely life is, says, Sweet, sweet, sweet interlude, sweet, sweet, sweet interlude. And if you enter the barn, the swallows swoop down from their nests and scold, Chicky, 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 they say. In early summer, there are plenty of things for a child to eat and drink and suck and chew. And dandelion stems are full of milk. Clover heads are loaded with nectar. The Frigidaire is full of ice cold drinks. The Frigidaire is a fridge on the refrigerator. And everywhere you look is life. Even in the little ball of spit on the weed stalk, if you poke it apart, it has a little green worm inside. And on the underside of the leaf of a potato vine are the bright orange eggs of the potato bud. Isn't that so beautiful? Did you picture it? Did you make a movie in your mind? Oh, great descriptive language from E.B. White. It was on a day in the early summer that goose eggs hatched. This was an important event in the barn cellar. Fern was there, sitting on her stool when it happened. Except for the goose herself, Charlotte was the first to know that the, gooselings, that the goslings had hatched. The goose knew a day in advance that they were coming. She could hear their weak voices calling from inside the eggs. And she knew that they were desperately cramped in position inside the shell and were most anxious to break through and get out. So she sat quite still and she talked less than usual, which is a lot for the goose, we know that. When the first gosling poked its gray green head through the goose's feathers and looked around, Charlotte spied it and made an announcement. I am sure, she said, that every one of us here will be gratified to learn that after four weeks of unremitting effort and patience on the part of our friend, the goose, she now has something to show for it. The goslings have arrived. May I offer my sincere congratulations. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, said the goose, nodding and bowing shamelessly. Thank you, said the gander. Congratulations, shouted Wilbur. How many goslings are there? I could only see one. There are seven, said the goose. Fine, said Trojan. Seven is a lucky number. Luck had nothing to do with it, said the goose. It was a good management and hard work. And at this point, Templeton showed his nose from the hiding place under where, Temple's, Wil where Wilbur's trough is. And he glanced at Fern, then crept cautiously toward the goose, keeping close to the wall. Everyone watched him, for he was not well liked, nor trusted. Luck, he began in his sharp voice. You say you have seven goslings. There were eight eggs. What happened to the other egg? Why didn't it hatch? It's a dog. I guess, said the goose. What are you going to do with it? Continued Templeton, his little round beady eyes fixed on the goose. You can have it, replied the goose. Roll it away and add it to that other nasty collection of yours. Templeton had a habit of picking up unusual objects around the farm and storing them in his home. He saved everything. Certainly or gladly, said the goose. You may have the egg, but I'll tell you one thing, Templeton, if I ever catch you poking, oking, oking your ugly nose around our gossling, I'll give you the worst pounding a rat ever took. And the goose opened its strong wings and beat the air with them to show his power. He was strong and brave, but the truth is that both the goose and the gander were worried about Templeton, and with good reason. The rat had no morals, no conscience, no scruples, no consideration, no decency, no milk of rodent kindness, no compunctions, no higher feelings, no friendliness, no anything. He would kill a gosling if he knew he could get away with it. The goose knew that. Everybody knew that. And with her broad bill, the goose pushed the unhatched egg out of the nest and the entire company watched in disgust while the rat rolled away with it. Even Wilbur, who could eat almost anything, was appalled. Imagine wanting a junky old rotten egg, he muttered. A rat is a rat, said Charlotte. She laughed a tinkling little laugh. <laughs> but my friends, if that ancient egg ever breaks, this barn will be untenable. What do you mean? said Wilbur. It means that no one will be able to live here on account of the smell. A rotten egg is a regular stink bomb. I won't break it, said Templeton. I know what I'm doing. I handle stuff like this all the time. And he disappeared into his tunnel, pushing the goose egg in front of him. He pushed and nudged, pushed and nudged until he proceeded in rolling it to his lair under the trough. That afternoon, when the wind had died down and the barnyard was quiet and warm, the gray goose led her seven goslings off of the nest and out into the world. Mr. Zuckerman spied them when he came in over supper. Well, hello there, he said, smiling all over. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven baby geese. Now, isn't that lovely? And that is the end of chapter six. So let's talk about our five finger retell in this. The characters, I would say the main characters in this story is the goose and all of her little goslings. We also have all the other animals in the barn, most particularly Wilbur and Charlotte. The setting, still the barn on Zuckerman's farm and the problem, the problem I would probably say is that only seven out of the eight eggs hatched. The solution, well, Templeton took that eighth egg with Charlotte's warning that not to break it. And the very end, Suckerman saw as the goose was leading her seven goslings out of the barn and everyone was really happy. So that's our five finger retail of chapter six of Charlotte's Web. Thank you so much for joining with us and let's continue to develop our love of reading together. Till next time.